here today. Um, after this discussion led by Kevin, uh, we're going to be making zines, and uh, there'll be book signings, so please join. Thank you. Check, check. Yo, hey, all right. Let's get into this. Hey, what's up, everyone? How you doing? Good. Wow. Welcome to the MLK Library, baby. We're here uh, for the book release of Shotgun Seamstress with Osa Ato herself. Uh, make some noise for her. Huh? And we are joined by a panel of other zinesters, you know, here to talk zine, talk shop, you know, just get acquainted and uh, have a good time. How's that sound? Cool. Hell yeah. Let's go down the list, starting with all the way at the end. Uh, Ambrose Nam, or eh, Ambrose Zams. Excuse me, the end is silent. We went over this. Uh, from Demystification, make some noise for him. Uh, Fabiola Ching to his left uh, from Hermetic State. Uh, we got Rachel Ags right next to them. Oh, I Trust My Guitar. And next to them, we got Alex Smith, uh, Arc Dust. And last but not least, the person of the hour, uh, Osa Ato, a shotgun seamstress. A toy, a toy, excuse me. This is my nightmare coming true. <laughs> Uh, so, Osa, you want to talk about the book a little bit? Sure. Um, well, uh, this book was, um, it's a second edition. Um, I made a cut and paste scene from 2006 to 2015. I did maybe about an issue a year, um, and it was all just, um, like a black punk fanzine, um, full of, like, interviews of, um, musicians and artists that I admired. Most of them were my friends and people I ran into on um, tour. I was touring a lot at the time within this band called New Blood, so the scene would never have um, existed if it wasn't for like the, um, the circumstance of like being on tour at the same time, because it put me in touch with a lot of different black punks in different states. Um, and um, yeah, so I'm just excited that it's out again and available for everyone. This is the first time it's had this kind of um, like distribution. It was um, published as like a, in, through a DIY press in 2015, uh, sorry, 2011. For the first time, that was issues one through six. So this one has um, issues one through eight, as well as um, a mini issue called um, Niger Punks, which was a quarter sizing that I made about the experience of being a Nigerian American punk. Um, a Nigerian American punk, yeah. And it was an interview with me and three of my Nigerian American punk friends. Um, so I'm just happy to have it available um, to everyone. And I'm excited that everyone else is still excited about this project that I had no expectations about, you know, like where it was going to end up or what it was going to be in the long run. So yeah, thanks everybody for being here and still being excited about this, this project that I started uh, 15 years ago. Hell yeah. Um, and just so everyone on this panel here has made zines before, yeah. and uh, so just starting with Ambrose and going down the line, what inspired you to get into the whole world of zines? Um, uh, okay, I would say what inspired, I mean, being a punk. Being into punk, like that's it. It's like another part of the, it's a way to be involved. It's like one of the many things, like I think that uh, people often, you know, obviously will be like, oh, I want to start a band, I want to do this thing. I never really like, you know, at p points in my life I thought I wanted to be in a band, but I don't think I ever really did. I think the allure for me was always zines, always, you know, so going to shows and finding zines like when I was 13, 14 or whatever, finding Heart Attack, you know, and like, which is a zine that was, you know, well done, like that made me be like, oh, these are cool. Here's a way to get information. Here's a way to build community. Here's a thing to do that. So I would say that uh, that's what drew me to zines in the first place. And then later making them because um, it's a way to be involved and do service to your, you know, your scene, to your community. Hell yeah. Uh, Fabiola? Um, I think it was, just, it was just very accessible. Um, I was on the internet all the time and um, 
I grew up around like Rookie Mag and just, you know, just that very particular era of like really young teenage girls on the internet doing things because like they can. So it was very accessible and it was just easy. So, yeah. Hell yeah. Rachel? Um, I would say Osa. <laughs> I read Osa zine and then that made, made me want to make my own. Um, but also, like, yeah, everything that you were talking about with punk as well, just like um, everyone I knew was kind of making zines and like it, it felt like a really fun way of being part of that community. And like, I think I also, <laughs> I was rereading my first scene this morning and like just cringing so hard because I was like 23 or something and like, I think I was, I was using it as a way of like figuring out my identity, like talking about um, being mixed race and queer and just like, I didn't really have, I grew up like in the countryside, very isolated, didn't have queer friends or like uh, black and brown friends at all. So like, it was my way of sort of being like, here is all the stuff about me that I don't really understand. Um, but also I love music and like, I want to communicate and I want to share and yeah, it just like was yeah also really accessible and easy and not as scary as the internet. Like I didn't really um, I didn't really use like social media at that time. Uh, it didn't exist in the same way either. But um, yeah, zines were like just another outlet to express myself. Nice, Alex. Um, I think this is on. I think for me, I started in high school, like back in the '90s, and um, I discovered a. Uh, underground newspaper that was circulating around in school and I was like I'm gonna do my own version of this because it kind of blew my mind and opened up uh, different avenues and um, uh, communication for me and so me and my friends started one called the other 40% and it was, uh, you know we were listening to a lot of public enemy and like X clan and <laughs> stuff like that and so it was like very militant and stuff so and uh, we started passing these around in school um, and uh, we kind of kept it anonymous, so it was like this, this kind of weird secret thing, and it was probably like my first foray into like um, alternative whatever, and just being like able to express myself or whatever. So um, if the principal at J. H. Rose High is watching this, yes, it was me. <laughs> <laughs> Suspicions were correct, but I think the Statue of Limitations is well gone on that one. Uh, <laughs> then, I, then when I got into punk, I started my own zine called Bacteria Panic, and I interviewed like, I interviewed like wild bands. Some of them I didn't even get to transcribe, like Los Crudos and um, Propagandi and Bikini Kill and stuff. It was like a different time where you could just like walk up to people and be like, hey, be in my zine. <laughs> it's like, you know, so it was just really interesting. And um, Art Dust came about because I started doing um, uh, science fiction readings and I wanted something tangible to um, either give out or maybe sell at the end of the readings. So yeah, that's how Arc Dust, my sci-fi zine, was born and is heavily influenced by Shotgun Seamstress and um, just people like Ramir Bearden and um, uh, like, you know, Faith Ringgold and all those people that just like Dave Hammonds that just like brought that sort of cut and paste culture into existence, you know, like kind of like pre-punk, you know, and um, so, and of course it was inspired by like the Black Panther newspaper and of course actual uh, DIY punk stuff. So like, I put all those influences into making Arc Dust and, and it got published and here we are, so, yeah. Hell yeah. Uh, Osa, do you remember when you first started getting into zines? Because it was like happening around you, everyone was doing it. But do you remember the first thing that you felt compelled to write about? To like, that you had to put on paper and let the people know how you felt? Shotgun Seamstress was my first zine and I was like 25, 26. So I had been in zine culture, reading people's zines for a long time before that. Um, I didn't have like a teenage zine or anything like that. So um, yeah, issue one was it. Like that was the first time I felt ready to make a zine, I guess. Um, yeah, and as an interviewer, I'm like, I have so many questions for Alex. Like, I, I got to, like, maybe we could, you know. But um, I just feel like a lot of it was um, trying to create this world that felt like being a black punk was um, kind of, like, normalized. Um, and so with your, um, like, I don't know, with, like, sci-fi, I guess I just thought it was, like, an interesting thing where you're, like, kind of inventing these worlds where anything's possible. Mm. 
And I feel like that's like the link between um, our work, even though it's completely, completely different. Like I literally just wrote a, a fanzine and you're doing these like comics about sci-fi, but um, I know I'm not answering your question, but after hearing you talk, I'm like, like these are the ideas that are coming into my head, right so yeah. Yeah, yeah, get them out. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that was it. But yeah, I mean, I think issue one was, um, like the first time I felt compelled to like sit down and write, even though um, I was in Portland at the time. And like I was telling you, and uh, we talked the other day, the first zine fest was in 2001, which was like uh, Portland Zine Symposium, which was the year that I happened to move there. Everybody around me was making zines. And I guess I felt totally fine just being a reader and a fan. And the same with music. I felt great being like a, just a fan for a really long time before I felt like starting my first band or starting my first zine, so. Hell yeah. Do you, does anyone up here feel like if zines weren't already a thing that you would have been able to find your way into punk and felt as comfortable in it without that aspect of it being around? Or do you think that was like the gateway 100% for sticking it through? Well, um, I can't imagine um, a punk without zines. So I can't imagine a, well, I just can't imagine a punk without independent or pri like independent media of any kind or whatever, because if you are not in control of the tools of that, I don't know, I just can't, like it's like, I can't even imagine that being a disconnected thing. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I guess in the same way, like, you know, I mean, in the same way there are like music magazines or whatever that I like, there is almost no music without the press for music sometimes too, but I don't care about that. I care about punk. So it's like, that is, so yeah, I don't know. I couldn't imagine it, but I think I would have, I got into punk without knowing zines were a thing. So yes. Oh. Yeah. Um, but then when I got there, I was like, oh yeah, duh, this is obvious. So yeah, I don't know. Okay, right on. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I think um, the two are married, kind of. Um, yeah. Because uh, I remember, um, actually, the show where I, I interviewed Propagandi was a very like eye-opening show for me because um, it was my first time at a house show that wasn't just like a drunk party, and it was the first time I was seeing bands that were like specifically connected to DIY music and had that lineage from like I guess maybe like from like Discord and uh, Kill Rock Stars and stuff that had that specific kind of like um, post-punk lineage to it. And um, it was a very different sound and a very different striking, like emotional uh, uh, power. And just so after the bands would perform, like, you know, there was like potlucks and there was like food nut bums, this and that, and there was like flyers for things and uh, zines and like records that were hand stamped and stuff. So that. So experiencing that got me out of, because um, Propagandi was on, this is very punk minutia, but Propagandi was on like a subsidiary of Epitaph or something like that, I can't quite remember. And um, so it was like going from like listening to Rancid, Green Day, Propagandi, to like being involved in like DIY stuff, like almost overnight, and zines were a part of that, and just like seeing this DIY culture of like you can do it yourself, hand stamp this and that, was like very eye-opening for me. So like the two are practically inseparable, I think. And I eventually ended up writing for Heart Attack fanzine, actually, which is like kind of fun little 360, but yeah. I, I can't see the two being separate, so. Hell yeah. Uh, yeah. For the record, neither can I. <laughs> uh, I just want to say, I, for me, it's very literal, because I literally read Shotgun Seamstress and then started a band. So. Really? <laughs> it was like very... Like, you know, I, I owe I so a lot because I feel like it was like New Bloods came through town. I didn't even go to the show. I missed the show. I was like off busy being stupid and young. <laughs> and uh, someone's like big sister went to the show, uh, got me a zine because they were like, oh, like I know a brown person that likes music <laughs> and like gave it to me. And like, yeah, I just like read that and, and it sort of like really fired me up. And I, I kind of always like, kind of wanted to be in a band but really didn't I couldn't see myself in the the punk scene that I knew because it was very like straight and white and I think like it really like lit a fire under me to be like no I really want to do this and I kind of have to do this because like there's not that many people that look like me like um you know being like loud and and kind of like messy and weird and like it yeah 
So it's very, it's very like literal for me, and I hope that there's still like kids doing that with sh shotgun seamstress or other zines. Like I think it's really important. Hell yeah, agreed. <laughs> um, yeah, and on that, I mean, to that point, do you guys feel like there is not a? L do you feel like the interest in zines has dissipated over time, or do you feel like it's still going pretty strong with like the younger generation, or just people in general nowadays? Oh, yeah, totally. I think people will always be interested in zines, or just any like method of independent publishing. It might not be exactly the same, you know, as time goes on. I didn't, I didn't discover zines through punk. I'm not really a punk. Um, so um, I discovered punk through zines, you know. So it's probably going to more of how people process zines, how we distribute it, how we meet each other through it. But I, I've only seen an uphill, yeah. Also, it seems like the definition of zine has expanded a lot since like I started making zines. I feel like, I mean, at some point, like Urban Outfitters had a zine. Do you know what I mean? Like zines could be anything. People call like corporate glossy magazine zines. So when you say like, do people have interest in zine culture? It's like, what is that even? Like what, what even is that anymore? Um, and then obviously the answer would be yes, because it's so many different things, you know? Um, like anything from an art book. Like when you go to zine fests and things like that these days, it's not even like, me and Ambrose talk about this a lot, it's not even just like black and white Xerox copy zines, it's like Rizzo and um, screen printed and it could be like comics or just anything. So I think the fact that it is like this huge wide category now is also like maybe helping keep it relevant in a way. Um, you can have like an e-zine that isn't even on paper, you know? So I just think the fact that zines are, can be anything is kind of helping keep it relevant. Yeah. It's, yeah, there's no rules with zines. There, is no, there are yeah. no rules. And then also a big re reason that I decided to republish this book is because I got an email from like a 16-year-old that was mm. like, I can't find your book oh. anywhere. And I was like, 16-year-olds still care about zines. That's Very cool. Well. <laughs> Because I was like, oh, maybe like everyone's on like Tumblr. Well, I know Tumblr isn't even what it used to be, but like, you know, I just thought that people were using other things, podcasts, whatever it is. Because I also think like podcasts are like zines, especially when they started. Like you could listen to a podcast that was like very crappily recorded, you know, that made by anybody about anything, you know. Um, so I was like, oh, there's all these things that can take the place of zines now, but it just seems like people still care about zines. So <laughs> no matter what the age group. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually thinking about that with like, sorry, um, like zines versus internet. Like, because I sometimes think like, oh, do, do zines have a space because the internet is so like, and social media is just like, it's so easy to broadcast what you're thinking or feeling. But there is this like weird, like, like if you say something on the internet, like everyone can comment on it or like respond to it. And there's like, a real vulnerability to that that like I think maybe makes you filter and edit yourself in a way that you wouldn't if you're making something that is like physical and just like yours and like has a start and a finish like I don't know I feel like this yeah reading some of the stuff I wrote about as a young person I'm like whoa <laughs> I mean I'm glad it's not on the internet I'm glad it's on paper <laughs> but also um, I don't know if I would have been like that confident to do that um, online, in like in a big sort of online yeah. forum. I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> it totally makes sense, but at the same time, I feel like because the internet became this place where people dialogue so much, it's made um, like mail die down. Like zines used to be more about dialogue. Maybe they still are, I don't know. Like do people, does anybody here still write zines and get a ton of mail? I mean, because that's how it used to be for me. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't like you wrote a zine and then it just was this thing that kind of existed in a bubble, like people wrote you back. And that's how you found friends and stuff. So, I mean, it's a different type of dialogue on the internet. I feel like it's like really fast and it lasts for one day and people comment in short form rather than like zines being missives and then getting these like long 
form responses back. Yeah, that's, um, that's a good point. So yeah. that, I mean, that's still vulnerable, really mm -hmm. vulnerable. And like a lot of the zines that um, were, um, I guess, like popular, the zines that I was reading a lot in the late 90s and early 2000s were like riot girl zines that were like, about like experiences of like sexual trauma, like body image, like that's really vulnerable stuff to talk about. That's really scary, like whether it's on paper or on the internet. Mm -hmm. And I feel like I even see maybe less of that, those like types of discussions because the internet is not the safest place to talk about those things. Mm -hmm. um, but still, people are making themselves very vulnerable, talking about very personal issues, um, but then also getting that feedback like getting letters from people being like, I'm going through the same thing, your zine made me feel less alone, you know, so. Mm. It's harder to dismiss too, like if you're in your room at night or whatever and you're reading something that's like tangible and um, you know, it's easier for that idea to sink in and if you do plan to write someone back, like you have time to formulate your thoughts, whereas on the internet, someone writes something really personal and maybe even beautiful, and you're just like, that sucked. And then you go on and like, make a sandwich, you know? <laughs> so, so, right, right. <laughs> then you go back to looking at like cats doing ninja moves or something. So uh. it's, it's like a totally different like dichotomy, and I think that like zines will always be there because of that. Like people who are searching for this sort of, um, these words that they can like have seep into their soul, right? Like it's hard to get that across on the internet because it is so, uh, disposable, I think. And like kids are still getting blown away by it. Like I do workshops every once in a while and I'm like, we're gonna make a zine. They're like, what's that? And then I'm like, yeah, we can make our own magazine. They're like, oh, wow, I didn't know we can still do that. So like these are the kids that have all the tumblers and all of the TikToks and like easy access to like AI where they can type a thing, but they still are wowed by being able to like take a paper and scissors and pencil and make some. I also think like making a zine now or making any sort of the physical thing or whatever is more of a, um, it's a like kind of a, not to be totally corny, but I'm gonna be corny. It's like a declaration of love for the medium. Cause you're not doing it for, if you wanted to get attention or get interaction or whatever, like you post something on Instagram or like make a tweet that was like controversial, like you can do whatever you want. Like there's way faster ways to communicate and like get that communication back. So I think like the, the idea behind making something that's print is like, you have to be like, is caring about the craft of print, or not craft, because that sounds like so weird, because like, I'm not making the paper. But it's like, you care about the, the format, you care about the medium, you think it's important, and, and maybe even part of you feels important to be a part of a lineage of people that make that medium, you know, as opposed to, um, I, I feel like, you know, especially in the 90s, I mean, I wasn't around at, in punk in the 90s, but it's like, you, um, you had to make uh, like you had to make this to reach other people in other places. You had to meet people like you via this. Now people like make friends kind of via different you know avenues. Different like it's way quicker to make a friend on Tumblr or Instagram or whatever. I mean Tumblr like ten years ago, but like Instagram now than it is to make one through a Z now or whatever. And like I'll say this like I don't I don't ever I don't think I I maybe I've never gotten a letter from a zine I made ever. You know what I mean? And it's fun, like, you know, and I, the first zine I made was in 2013 or whatever, which I was 22, I guess, so. And it's like, I've never once, um, like, received one, but I've, um, but like, it doesn't, it didn't like make me not want to do the thing anymore. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know, because I care so much about, like, not to be like pious, I don't think it's like important to care. I just think it's, I think zines are cool, so I wanna make them, you know, I don't know. I've never got a letter either. What's up? Yeah, yeah. I've I put my address on everyone. Yeah, <laughs> never got a letter. Got a, like an email or two, but never like, never someone, you know. And maybe a letter from someone I knew, actually. That's not true. I got a letter from someone I already knew about it. He loves to send mail, though. It's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like what you said about um, caring about it in order to do the physical act of making a paper product. Yeah. Um, I think that's what kind of also Dream of the Zines is. Um, this declaration of love, this like act of service, and you want it to be really good, and you want it to be beautiful, mm -hmm. and you want the message to, you want it to meet the people that you want it to meet, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah. So yeah, I think that's what's important about zines, as it doesn't matter what format it's in, I think um, it has a very special way, or zines have a very special way of transmitting love that cannot be co-opted or like diminished, even if Urban Outfit makes multiple zines, you know? Um, they're very special in that regard. 
Yeah. All right, yeah. <laughs> We're like, any more questions? Um, I do. So have any of you um, been surprised at where being so involved in your own personal zine has gotten you? For example, like maybe an interview with someone that you've always looked up to, and without that zine, you would have probably never been in, in that room interviewing them. Like any situation like that. Like right now. I was going to say, I'm just like, yeah. every <laughs> single step of the way, yes. This one. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I would say right now, um, I, um, I'm, I'm always grateful for like, I've made most of my friends um, through just writing and trying to reach out to people through language. Um, that's how I met Ambrose. Um, well, I met you through Paola, actually. Yeah. But I met Paola through like writing and through this like desire to like create community around language, yeah. you know? So I'm always in awe. I think I can, I owe my whole life or my life as I know it currently, to it's not just zines, but like literature, you know, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I feel like every step of the way, it's been surprising. Um, like I, I talked to you about, I didn't know that there was going to be more than one issue of Shotgun when I first started making it. It's not even numbered, because I wasn't sure there was going to be a number two. Um, so the fact that it lasted for as long as it did is surprising. Um, everybody I got to meet through that, I mean, like one of my favorite musicians is saying that they never would have started a band without reading my zine is incredible and like I don't even understand how to like assimilate that information, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, everything about it has been completely shocking. Yeah, but I feel like that's the whole point is just take the first step, because you never know where it's going to lead you. Um, yeah, and it doesn't have to be a big deal. Like, it was just, I think the first issue was the shortest one. It may have, may have been like, I don't know, like five sheets of paper folded or something. Like, it wasn't a big deal, and I feel like it doesn't have to be complicated. Just start. Like, just do something small, because you just never know where it's going to lead you, you know? Hell yeah. Um, I guess we'll open it up to the floor. Does anyone have any questions for anyone up here? All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, what I'm most curious about is like, I don't know too much about zine culture, and I'm sure it's different across the country or your respective places. So maybe just sharing like um, how you guys uh, disseminate zine. Like you were mentioning, you shared it through your school anonymously. How how did others like share and come across zines? And um, like, do you trade zines? Kind of like baseball cards. I'm just like kind of curious about that whole aspect of like the zine community and culture? Um, I think it's changed a lot in the last, uh, I mean, in a long time. I don't know, when I was a kid um, and I got into zines, I also think there's different kinds of things, you know? I think like, um, like if you go to a zine fest now, like we're talking about now, it's a lot of things that maybe not necessarily, I'm happy exists, but not necessarily are my, in my wheelhouse or things that I can necessarily relate to because the way I got into zines was through punk and the zines that I like pulled, like it's kind of like, um, like that is the alert, that's like the alert to me, and being tied to a wider like international network of DIY hardcore punk or whatever, that's the appeal for me. But I think that it's so cool like, and I, and I think really quick, I wanna dap up, like Fabiola made me realize later because she used to do a zine called Coalition, and I found, like I like, when I met her, I saw it, and she was like, I don't know how, like 18 or whatever, and I was like, this is sick, like, and it made me realize that there was a world outside of that, but it kind of felt like a punk zine and not necessarily like a personal zine, like a per zine or like a, like a, which also is cool on pro, or like a Rizzo art zine or something something so there's that whole scene so I think for that world it might be a little different but I'll say like early on it's like I found out about zines from reading other zines <laughs> so it'd be like you know I'd read uh, Maxim Rock and Roll which is I mean kind of like the 
you know, or our heart attack, as we talked about, which both kind of function as like, let's say, um, for a lack of complete lack of better words, please, like a Rolling Stone and spin of DIY hardcore punk. You know, it's like uh, it's like they and in the back there would be reviews of zines. So then I'd find out about other zines, and they would have addresses and email addresses at that point because this is like 2004. They have email addresses, so you would just email the person and like I would put money in an envelope and send it away. You know, and in the, like in the 90s even, they were like, I, we talk, I, talk about, I was thinking about this yesterday, but there was a zine called like, uh, that I think about a lot called Factsheet 5 that was just like all a zine about zines. Like it had reviews of zines, it had ads for other zines, it had descriptions and everything for other things. So I think there was just like a kind of more built network, especially, I mean, not that wasn't a punk specific thing, but late also especially in punk where you'd find out about zines or whatever. But the first time I ever found out about zines at all was at shows. So I'd go to a show and there'd be a table and it was also like kind of the era of the crime think, which is like an activist collective, whatever, reprinted zine. So I'd get a zine on consent, get a zine on radical sobriety, and then I'd buy like um, a zine about like a D-beat band or whatever, and I didn't know anything about, and I'd be like, oh, this is like all cool and all or whatever. So at first I think it was physical spaces, and now it's more so the internet. Like you post something on Instagram and then everyone will buy it or whatever, you know? It's like, and stuff like that's kind of the only reason to worth keeping that stuff, in my opinion, like social media or whatever, is like, uh, like that sort of connection's gone because those kind of physical spaces have dwindled, you know? like it's less likely for you to walk into a record store and find a zine that like you know you you want to buy or like whatever it's less likely for there to be a record store or a bookstore around you know so yeah so those are some ways i think now the internet is really used as a tool but before it was print i mean whatever way is good though you know and whatever scale is good like yes. it's totally legitimate to just make 10 and give it to your yep. friends and i think that that's actually kind of more the beginnings i mean i can't really speak to that cuz i wasn't around for like the very beginnings of you know, zine culture, whatever, however far back you want to put that. But I do feel like in the 90s, it was like you could just make 20 copies and give them to your friends, and that could be the end of it. Yeah. And um, I mean, I feel like my approach was like kind of like that. Like it was like giving them away to people that I knew. It was tabling them at shows. And then a little bit of the internet, like me and Alex were just talking about the Afropunk message boards, which is actually how we met <laughs> um, in what, like 20, 2000? Like, it was like right when I moved to Philly, so probably like 2004 or something. Okay, something 2004. Like yeah, maybe, so, maybe earlier, but. <laughs> but um, so I remember messaging that board, because that was the first time I could like target black punks. That was like the first time that you could like actually speak to directly to a bunch of black punks that weren't in your town. And I was like, if you want one, just hit me up. And I just sent it out for free to like anybody who responded. So that, was, that, that wasn't the internet that we have now. It wasn't like heavy social media, but it was a way to like expand your reach a little bit. Um, but yeah, it can be casual though. I just want to stress that. Like, I feel like nobody treats anything casually anymore. My <laughs> God, things can just be relaxed. <laughs> It doesn't have to be professional. It doesn't have to, you don't have to be worrying about distribution or metrics or like anything. Like, yeah, branding. You, oh my God. Like, we can just, you can just make 10 and give them to your friends. That's, that's legitimate. Um, and then, but you, what I'm saying is though, you never know like what could happen after that. Like, your friend could give it to somebody else and it could spark something. But don't be afraid to like do something simple and small. Yeah, I yeah. definitely uh, relate to that. Like, I've I've never, <laughs> I've never really done a run of more than like twenty or thirty of my zines. Like, still, and I really like. I've I think I made my first one probably because I went on a tour with a band that was I was just kind of like depping on guitar for like an indie pop band, and I felt a bit uncomfortable. But I really sort of had this desire to bring something with me that was like, this is who I actually am, <laughs> and like I wanted to communicate on this tour, and so it was very specific. Um, but like, yeah, just it was very like, I just want to be in this space. I want to like communicate, um, and I still do it like that. I still like just occasionally bring a bunch of zines to a show, and like, yeah, that's why sure. I like doing it. <laughs> oh yeah, I've been make I make a bunch of little random zines since I was 19, and I love to do this thing where I make like 10 copies and find like a record store in a town I don't live in, and then just leave them there, and <laughs> that's it. And I've always wondered, like, if it ever, you know, come up again in life. It hasn't. But, <laughs> you know, who cares, baby? It's low stakes. You know, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, definitely can treat them like, bas like baseball cards. 
I feel like that's kind of what we're doing. Even when, even when I started making zines, they were mostly virtual, but I feel like, um, I feel like when I would see other people making it and they kind of, we kind of mirrored each other, it felt like we were talking to each other but not directly. So you definitely can um, have that similar method of circulation digitally. Um, doesn't have to be, um, I worry a lot about branding, unfortunately, um, but that's the great thing about zines, they don't ask too much of you, um, just for you to um, try your best, you know, so yeah. And I think, um, like additionally, sorry, well, we, and we need to take more questions, right, but I mean, it's just like the casual nature of it. So like me and Rachel were like lightly talking uh, about like being embarrassed about like the things that we put out before. And I feel that way about certain things in the book. Like a lot of it is like there's typos. I mean, it's not edited in any way. Um, so yeah, I think like we're just treating this medium like it is casual and organic. Um, like you're writing to your friends. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just, there's things in it that I would probably want to talk about differently now. Um, but I think that that's what's also like special about them is that they are kind of raw and unedited and unfiltered. And you might look back on it and be like, I can't believe I said that thing, but at least you're brave enough to put it out there. And like somebody might still relate to it in a way that you could never have predicted, so. Nice. Any other questions? I right, had two right over here. I want to get the mic over. Can you guys hear me? I think they're going to bring you a mic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, hi. So I was just wondering. Okay, we'll do this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, hello. <laughs> hello, hi. Uh, so I guess my question is uh, around uh, zine culture and your experience meeting other black and brown punks as zinesters. I know for myself in the 90s, there wasn't, most of the zines that I got into were like riot girl zines. There was a lot of white women talking about body issues and things that were relevant, but I didn't really connect with um, until I found uh, Evolution of a Race Riot by Mimi. And uh, it kind of just blew my mind and led me to uh, the greater community of black and brown punks that I uh, still to this day at 41 know and hello. So uh, I'm just wondering, do you remember um, having that situation where you were like, this is a gateway for me to meet other um, bl uh, black or brown punks or uh, folks who were in, involved in um, alternative subcultures. I know you're not a punk, so, uh, and, and do you have a, sort of that tangible memory of, of making those connections? I think for me, it was more, um, well, when I did my punk zine, I didn't really meet anybody. I was in uh, North Carolina and sort of like, um, uh, sort of like, not necessarily isolated, but not really integrated into like, um, this like constant continuous culture. Um, I had to like really seek out and find culture like really hard. Um, but I think once I started doing my science fiction zine, like a ton of avenues opened up from just this little like, you know, 20 page thing, cut and paste thing that I did just to have something at these events that I was putting together. So um, that definitely opened um, a lot of doors for me. Like I, I found like the Afrofuturist community through this zine and um, it really was a, a catalyst because people respond to like touch and feel stuff in so in such a visceral way. Like I could have put Arc Dust on the computer, but I don't think it would have had the same impact. Like I don't think it would have had the same like um, oh that's that person that does that thing kind of uh, vibe. I think um, they inform each other in a lot of ways. Like my oh my god online presence and. Also, Arctus kind of informs each other. So, and and it's true. A lot of these communities, especially now, are born through the accessibility of the internet, like um, the SoundCloudification of everything, where it's like people can like create something and have it quote blow up. Um, but for me, it was like a gradual like meeting of like really really rad people within like the um, sci-fi community, and you know, I met some of my favorite collaborators um, and friends through that, through, that, uh, through that format and just having this zine was definitely a catalyst for it. So yeah, it's definitely, um, I, always, I always tell people like who are always kind of like struggling with like 
trying to get their art out there more. I'm just like, just do a zine. <laughs> and like, to me, that's like the very first thing that I think of. And like, it's so weird that like people don't think about that anymore. Like, they're just like, it's not even a part of their language anymore sometimes. And I'm just like, just do a zine. And it still blows their mind to this day. And it's, it's really dope that people can still do like a physical copy of something. And like you said, you brought yours on tour and you met people and, and just have that connection. And so I, it, it was later when I did Art Dust that I really started making connection. Um, my early zine, I, I kind of just like want to like smack the crap out of that guy because <laughs> like I don't even know what I was writing in that zine. But um, yeah, it's just when you're young, you write these really visceral things and it's like, but yeah, um, I think my newer zine, I guess I was more focused and had like a lot more energy and more desire to meet people through it and not just kind of like rage or whatever. But I honestly feel like for me, it was backwards. Um, you mm -hmm. were there. It was like when I moved to, two th um, to Oakland in 2005 and was like finally met a bunch of other black and brown punks, it became like what I needed to say became clear. Like when you have like all white friends or you feel like your readership would be all white, it, it just was harder for me to even put words to what I had in my heart to say. Mm -hmm. And so when I met you and Aidy and Brontes and Jacob, I was like, I'm writing this for my friends. Like I'm writing a zine that would make my friends happy, you know? And so that is kind of what Shock and Sutures is about. And um, I mean, I did end up meeting people through the zine, but none of those connections are as strong as like the people that I met before I started writing it that like helped me like figure out what I was trying to say. Like, yeah, for me it was almost the opposite, I want to say. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would actually say like, I don't know, I sometimes think this is a specific thing to the UK, but I think it's just, it's not, it's just really bad in the UK. Or well, 15 years ago, I would say around, it was particularly bad when, mm -hmm people just don't talk about race. Like, it's just like such a taboo. And I think it maybe is changing, but like, you know, when I was like in my early 20s, like it was just, I did have black and brown friends, but we just sort of never acknowledged the mm. elephant in the room, mm. especially within the punk community, like in, in the, uh, my local music scene, and um, just wasn't talked about. And so finding like Shotgun Seamstress and Race Riot as well was like really key to sort of like be like, hey, have you read this? And like, then that opens up a conversation that like people weren't sort of, you know, previously like ready to have or willing to have. And so like, yeah, physical like printed uh, zines that talk about race have been like really, really like important for me in in like, yeah, forming friendships, but also just like starting conversations. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I would say, yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. I can mirror all of that. Um, it's so funny you mentioned. Um, evolution of race, right? I actually forgot that I read that when I was 17, and that's actually how I, that was my first venture into like punk, or an idea of what punk is. Um, I remember growing up just very like, very angry about like things like Riot Girl because I felt like, um, like where the niggas at, you know? I was like, where are the black people at? Mm -hmm. And so like, Coalition was basically a response to that. I'm like, where, what are black women writing about? Or, Rather, what a black young girl is writing about, like those who are doing it from like your home computers or like your laptops or beds, like what are they up to? So it was very much like like a yearning cry, like I don't want to be alone, you know. And it's like I felt very alone in that. I loved reading like Ricky Mag and all these things, but I felt very like um, it wasn't um, reflective of you know me as like a Cameroonian. Um, very lonely, like awkward black girl. And as I've gotten older, it's not important for me to be like reflected so um, intrinsically, but um, there's always that like yearn to not be alone. And yeah, I use the zines to not be alone, basically. Yeah. Oh, nice. I think, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think early on I actually kind of avoided um, specific um, specific like identity based sort of media uh, in that way because I was like oh this isn't really like well I never thought of um, I never thought of I guess even before I started 
like before, when I got into it before ever going to a show, but getting into, you know, that little, like the, the little space before you're like, oh, this is what I want to be before you're actually involved in it. I actually never thought it would be idyllic. So I think that I always, I was, I like went into it being like, oh yeah, I'm going to like face like people who are racist and like lots of people who are like kind of like fucked up and like not, sorry, uh, like not like, um, you know, not like totally, you know, like, you know, the, I mean, it's so funny because it's like there's the, I, there's just like the idea of like, yeah, I'm gonna be around like the freaks, whatever, like, you know, the, the Gigi Allen record title, you know, like, the, you know, like, you know, you know, like it's all sorts of like people who are like different and weird and some of them are gonna suck and some of them are gonna be cool and some, whatever. And so I think like when I got into it, I was like kind of shocked by the, the even like, especially here at the time, like even the like um, activist nature of it even. Like I was like, I was like, oh, like positively shocked by it. Like I was like, oh, this is cool. But I never, I, and even at the time, I remember like Afropunk happening or like it, it came out a couple years before I started going to shows, but I remember even avoiding it being like, I don't really want to see that because I think a lot of the early interactions I had with like the, the uh, like identity sort of focused writing were either like kind of like meandering riot girl writings, no disrespect to them, but like for me I was like kind of like, oh, I don't know anything about this, but also, and then or on the other end it was like very highly academic, you know, and I was like, I'm not this, like, you know what I mean, I want to hear about like cool stories and like tell me about a cool record, like I don't want to like, you know, but then looking back I now appreciate that stuff way more, so like it's funny and like, and I think Shotgun Seems just helped me do that because it was kind of written in the same, and I didn't realize this until later, it was kind of written in the same like voice that read like like queer and riot girl zines in the 90s, but like with a kind of a smarter tone, like a smart, like, you know, a smarter, more slick tone and, and a, like a more casual tone. Whereas a lot of the writing that was happening before was very, or not before, but a lot of the writing I was reading was very like a academic and I always felt like pretty stupid. So I was like, I don't know. You know I was like, yeah. So, so it, it happened later. I was never, obviously, I was always like extra excited to meet black punks and hear about black people in bands and stuff like that. But I don't think I ever wanted to engage with that media because I'd be like, well, I don't want to like, cause it's like so heady. It's like, I want to go to a show. I want to like hang out, tell me some lore. Like I want to know something cool. Like, you know what I mean? As opposed to like all, it being about like individual personal struggle, you know? And then now I recognize how you can do both. So anyway, yeah. Well. Hell yeah. Any more questions before we wrap anything? Right over here. All right. <laughs> um, I would love y'all to talk about your process in making zines. Like, do you think of a topic and then, like, uh, like what do you do after that? Kinkos. No. <laughs> I just, like, go to Kinkos and just dumb out. Like, I'll be the only person in there with, like, stacks of paper and, like, everybody's like, what is this guy doing? Like, people walk up to the counter with their little, like, thumb drives and stuff and, like, <laughs> wait, wait, and I'm just, you, like... Wait, you, like, go to Kinkos to, like, make your zine from the, yeah. the beginning? Yeah, yeah. What? That's what? That's how I, I made. At the end. That's how I made Arctis. Well, I mean, I've I, been I, I, sorry I, I, to interrupt. I, I've I been told to repeat my question on the oh, microphone. Okay. okay. Oh. <laughs> sorry, uh, but I would oh, love y'all yeah, to talk about so. your process in making zines. Like, do you think of a topic or a theme, and then what do you do after that? Oh, since I started, I'll, I guess I'll, I guess I'll rewind a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yes, I do have the spark of the idea, but. Um, I guess I was more thinking about like the physical aspect of oh, what okay, I'm doing. Okay. Yeah, like, <laughs> it's like I go down to Kinko's and I just kind of um, use that as my like studio. Um, but I guess um, for me, uh, I basically just kind of like write the stories and then um, I do collage work that either mirrors the story or is like um, reflective of the ideas and the themes in the story. Um, but I do everything cut and paste, um, and yeah. Um, that's pretty much my process. Um, I just wanted to give a shout out to Kinko's, I guess, <laughs> for still that existing exist. and for Wait, still. They do? It's like FedEx something. It's FedEx, or, yeah. My yeah. code doesn't. Yeah. My, my FedEx office code doesn't work anymore, so it's like I don't oh, go no. there anymore. I used to get oh. two cents a copy. I oh, scammer code, man! No Back longer. in the days, we just make yeah. copies and just like walk out. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> doesn't work anymore. Well, um, so the thing that's weird about like the. I guess the magazine, like, I mean, you still go to Kinko's or like try to, you know, if you got a job somewhere, hack it. If you got a copy, you know, that's what I would say. That's what I'd suggest or whatever. But like, uh, but it's like kind of weird because like, I guess the, the zine I do or whatever, demystification is like, uh, it's like full color print, which, you know, kind of makes me feel like I'm betraying my elders. But it's, um, and so like I send it off to someone and then they show up at my house, you know. 
Um, but the zines before I made just going, you know, I like, you know, it was the computer age, obviously, so I'd type everything out on a computer, or but then I'd bring records or anything I wanted to scan with me to uh, Kinko's when it was Kinko's. And there used to be, I grew up in Gaithersburg, Maryland, and there used to be the 24-hour Kinko's that was there. It's no longer, it's no longer 24 hours, but I would go and just like go at midnight or whatever, you know, and I'd go like by myself or like with a friend or whatever, and I'd just print stuff, you know what I mean? The same way I make a flyer, you know, you go and like, you photocopy something from a record or a book and then you like put it in the thing and that's kind of like the process. Um, but as far as like to the question before about like writing or whatever, I think um, for me the idea always comes first uh, as opposed to like, cause like the urge to make a zine, I don't think is, I, 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 want any, I want everyone to make a zine, I want everyone to do it, but at the same time for me it's like the importance is in the, the idea, what you're conveying, what you're like getting across, the thing you want to talk about, not so much just like my individual urge to make a zine isn't as important as the thing that's on the paper. So I think like for me it's like, yeah, you print, um, you come up with something, not come up with something, but like you think about things. Sometimes it takes a really long time to think about things. Sometimes you like have an idea and you write it down and it's stupid the next day or whatever, but then eventually you, you flesh it out into something that is a little more clear or whatever. And even, I mean, and even like, even if your goal is to make a zine, but also your goal is to say something you feel isn't being said, that is, I think, a goal maybe more, more broad than that. So yeah, I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. Um. I also recommend um, telling someone about it or collaborating with people. That's the bulk of my work has been um, through collaboration. Um, I also never, um, well not never, but um, most of my zines have been printed by someone else and it's shown up at my house. Um, but prior to that, um, I love to see what other people I know have done surrounding the topic. I love to see what my faves have done, and I can tell a friend about it, especially if they have a resource or a tool that I don't have, or if they have more knowledge or just insight that I respect regarding the topic or the idea. I find that when you share something, it all of a sudden becomes very, very real, and hence easier to do, so, yeah. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. we're going along. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I, to be honest, I haven't made a zine in such a long time that I feel a bit embarrassed to answer. I don't think there's a pattern because each thing I've done has been like specific to like maybe going on a tour and just being like, I want to bring something of that I've made, and so it'll be usually to do with that or like or yeah, I'll tell someone I'm making a zine so that to, they can hold me accountable, mm -hmm. um, uh, or like uh, maybe if there's a zine fair coming up, I might. But because I, I, I always have loads of ideas for zines in my head and then never do it, so uh, usually it, the, finding an idea is not the problem. It's like actually getting uh, myself together to do it. Uh, and yeah, um, we don't have Kinkos in the UK, but um, <laughs> we have like other um, kind of equivalents <laughs> where I take all my stuff. Um, and I don't use a computer. Well, I type on a computer, but then I I just do everything print stick and. Uh, do you, you probably don't have print stick in the US. US. It's a glue, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> it's a glue that people, zine makers in the UK love it. My friend has a tattoo of it. Um, anyway. Awesome. <laughs> all right, everyone. I think we are, are out of time, but uh, give it up to all our panelists today. And give it up for Osa today. Right on. Um, and uh, so everyone is welcome to uh, check out, also grab one of the books right outside uh, in the lobby area. This is what this is called, the lobby area. Um, get your book signed, pick up a copy, and also feel free to check out the Punk and Go-Go exhibits on the fourth floor after the book signing. And also everybody has um, zines and comics um, tabling um, outside as well, so. Hell yeah. Check it out and have a great rest of your Saturday. Thanks for coming. <laughs>